pointed uh, finger pointing imaging. You need to go white band. Uh, you, you need to go white field imaging uh, because of the following reason that the continuum uh, field that uh, the continuum primary beam sensitivity pattern that you see on the sky is no more limited just to the main lobe of the primary beam. So it extends well beyond the primary beam to try to find the what was the, called the main lobe of the primary beam. And in these beams, the sensitivity is more like 15, 20 percent, which is close to what the VLA used to have in the narrow band case. So here is your um, VLA sensitivity going out to twice the, or twice the primary beam of the white band, uh, primary beam of VLA. Uh, the other area is white band mosaic. Uh, and here is an example of a single pointing image uh, that we made, white band image with the EVLA in the galactic plane, the primary beam. Uh, the main lobe is somewhere there. Way out in the second or the third side lobe, you can see sources that you need to be involved. And uh, the problem that we are addressing here is that it might not be very clearly visible here, but there are <coughs> so there are errors associated with the strong sources all over the place. There's a very strong source. There's, there's the pulsar on top of the supernova remnant, which has very strong deconvolution errors. And we think these are sort of spectral deconvolution errors. We have applied MSMFS, which takes out the primary air, the frequency dependence of the sky, but still there are spectral, there are spectral effects left, and we think that is because of the primary beam spectral behavior. So this is a problem in uh, the single uh, pointing image. Here is the mosaic. Uh, this is not the final product. This is the image that I got from Margo. This is also a work in progress. I think he's got more data. There's a better image uh, that already exists of this field. And I didn't feel compelled to be I felt compelled to be honest with this term, that uh, not to make a pretty image. The issue here is that this is the, by far the strongest source. <coughs> it dominates all other deconvolution errors. There's another source here and another source here. Each of these sources are on the edge of some prime the primary beam of some pointing or the other. And the deconvolution errors there dominate this image. And we need to account for those errors. And the point to take here is that algorithms that might take out these errors but assume isolated point sources just don't work there. Yeah. They just don't work there. So what do we need to account? What are the direction-dependent effects we need to account for? As I said, one is time varying primary beam, which is rotation of the as in our rotationally asymmetric primary beams on the sky. Pointing errors, pointing errors is a second order effect. Uh, polarization effects. The dominant one being the polarization squint, which also then varies the time because of the rotation. This is specific to VLA. Arm also has a squint because of different reasons. So the W term, because you have to go far out. And if you are L band that far out, you, you do get affected by W. There's psi frequency dependence. When you have 2 to 1 band bandwidth ratio, that L band, uh, 1 gigahertz or 800 megahertz kind of a bandwidth, uh, the spectral index of the source around the sky actually have a Effect, which is way above the thermal noise. So you need to account for these. And you need to account for the primary beam frequency dependence because that is the dominant effect, roughly beyond the 50%, 40% point of the primary beam that becomes the dominant effect. So the algorithms available before we started thinking about all this, so we thought that, okay, what are the state of the art algorithms that we have? And are they sufficient to address the problem of addressing all these? So, State of the art algorithms are either that can be correct for time dependent, polarization dependent, uh, primary beam errors, and W term simultaneously. MSMFS, which solves for the frequency dependence of the sky and takes that out. Those are the advanced algorithms we had. And the question was are these sufficient to get to where we want? So, just to recap what the issues are, <coughs> here is the primary beam of EVLA at, at a particular frequency and projected on the sky as a function of time, it rotates. And if you have a source here versus a source there, it sees a very significant variation of the gain as a function of time. And the two sources see different variations of time. So it's a time-dependent, direction-dependent error, which is fairly strong. And that is what we correct by a projection. The <coughs> rotation of the primary beam on the sky also produces a very strong uh, time-dependent polarization effect, and what is being shown here is, in contour is the Stokes-I image, in grayscale, black and white here is the Stokes-V image, which is, which is different.
difference of the prime beam of the two parallel hands. Uh, and because the two parallel hand prime beams on the sky for EDLA point slightly differently because the squint, when you rotate that, you get, you put a source somewhere mm -hmm. there, you get a time varying amplitude goes like this. This is the RR visibility amplitude, this is the LL visibility amplitude. And because the squint has a function of time, it has a very strong time dependent polarization effect. Now, <clears throat> we can ignore all these things and say, okay, we do the, just the standard. Uh, say W projection and MS MFS kind of thing. So what is the kind of error we be limited to? And there's a quick analysis that <laughs> what is the error that you'll be left in your image that is given by the PSF convolved by uh, variation in the primary beam, for example, that you will get if you ignore all these variations for time and, 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 and polarization. So delta B is, if you do standard imaging, you'll be Assuming some average primary beam, which is rotational symmetric and all that. And what is the difference between the rotational symmetric average primary beam with the actual primary beam? So again, in contour is the instantaneous primary beam, and phase scale is the difference between the two. And as we expect in the first side lobes, of course, you get the maximum errors. But you also have significant errors within the main lobe at around 30, 30 percent point for the primary beam. This when combined with the fact that actually instantaneous PSF also changes, it rotates or changes in other ways. When you combine these two together and ask the question, what is what is the RMS noise in this kind of a thing? You, you get this kind of image, the RMS noise there is that. The peak error is some kind of number coming from that. You multiply these two. You get an order of magnitude estimate of where the error should be. And you'll be limited to 10 to 4, 10 to 5 kind of a dynamic range if you do all this. So if your science says that that dynamic range is sufficient for me, you don't need to do anything. Just kind of imaging with MSM effect would be fine. <clears throat> so in the interest of a discussion in the previous session of doing some focused, simple simulations, we did the simulation here. Uh, carefully designed simulation to uh, you know amplify the errors that we are trying to uh, address. So here is a simulation. Uh, I mean, not sure whether you can see the primary beam here, but you'll see the next slide. Here's the primary beam in, in contours. The contours are this is the 50 percent point, that is the 10 percent point, this is the 2 percent point, and the 2 percent side lobe of the primary beam is here. So here is the side lobe. You put a source in the in the side lobe at a 10 percent point in the center of the beam and at the 80 and 60 percent point of the of the primary beam. And again, asking the question. What is the best we can do? So if you ignore everything else, this is the image you get. The RMS noise there is about 10 to minus 4, and this is sufficient for you. I mean, I've cycled it to, to amplify the errors. But if your science allows you to work the 10 to 4 kind of a dynamic thing, you, you're just fine with doing normal imaging. Now, the state of the art algorithm with a projection and multi term uh, MS MFS. Oh, multi term MFS. We apply that and ask the question, where do you get? And that's the best image you can get. What you what this shows is that <clears throat> the projection has taken out all time dependent errors. MTMFS has taken out large parts of uh, all the frequency dependent errors. That includes the frequency frequency dependence that we put in the sky, plus the frequency dependence of the primary beam. <laughs> it certainly takes it out in the main lobe, which is not a surprise. I was very surprised to see that it did just quite well in the first side lobe. But the variations at the 10 percent point, it could not take out. Um, so we analyzed this a bit further and asked the question, does Y-band primary beam effects limit the imaging? And the answer is yes, is that if you require a dynamic range of greater than the 10 to 4 or 10 to 5, and I keep saying this range, this is a factor of 10 range here, because these estimates will depend upon very strongly about how your primary beam changes, how long did you observe, what are the side lobe patterns of the PSF, where were your sources located. So it depends on all kinds of things. So it's it's a range, kind of fourth and five kind of range. Of if you are, if you need beyond that, then yeah, you need to do something about the band, uh, wide band primary beams as well. So we didn't do as well as we thought. We thought you to take out everything. It didn't take out, and then the question is why? Why? Why didn't Malitam MFS didn't take out uh, the frequency dependence for all the sources. And we think this is the reason. 
that this is the frequency behavior as a function of uh, frequency, it, it, it just scales by blows as well as the main blows. And if you take a slice across that, this is the uh, red is the primary beam total power uh, curve. And in blue is the derivative as a function of frequency. And what this shows is that the frequency changes most rapidly around the half power point at the center of course. If you are doing an arrow field imaging, you don't need to worry about frequency dependent on the primary beam. But if you have sources here and and in the side look also as we have built image shows that R image shows that, then we need to account for this very strong frequency dependent. Not just that this frequency dependent also is time varying. Primarily because of the rotation of the primary view on the sky. So, pay attention to the blue curve here. And the animation axis is uh, walking away from the center <coughs> as you go out. Uh, I think the, the blue curve is along the green arrow. You get uh, frequency dependent, uh, which changes as you go out in the, in the primary view. Starts with looking like very flat, but then also develops the curvature, so you need to account for that. So, it's a direction dependent, frequency dependent effect. If you take the same thing along that direction, the curve looks very different. I don't have that curve, but it looks very different. So what you have is uh, frequency dependent, time dependent, uh, direction dependent uh, error that you need to now account. And because only average quantities are available by the time you get to the image domain, because image is really the average of all your data, if there is something that is varying with time or frequency along which you are averaging when you are doing MFS imaging, you don't have access to that that variability anymore in the image domain. And I think that's what is limiting us. You can ask the same question, how does it look for the uh, for the polarization? And this plot shows the entire problem that you need to solve. Here's the amplitude as a function of time. So things are varying as a function of time, clearly. In color, various plot shows uh, the various uh, frequency fans we have. So it, it clearly changes its frequency, scales its frequency. And these are the two parallel hands data for every frequency. And therefore, what you have is uh, polarization dependent, frequency dependent, time varying uh, that you might need to account for. So, how do we do wide band imaging? And, and, and for reasons that have been discussed several times in several meetings before, the preferred way of doing the wide band imaging for us is uh, MFS imaging, which fits everything onto a single grid. That's the optimal. Uh, single noise ratio kind of imaging. Mathematically speaking, that's what we do. TT corresponds to a Taylor term, so this <laughs> includes the issues of uh, multi term uh, MFMSS, uh, MFS uh, algorithm. You do, uh, you grid all your data in time and frequency onto a single, single grid. WT is the Taylor term way. CF is the convolution function. This is the aperture illumination, baseline data. It's a baseline aperture illumination, which is convolution with no actual aperture illumination, as a, which is a function of time, frequency, and polarization. And let's say frequency or the sky. Uh, or sky is only frequency dependent, it doesn't vary with time or polarization. So the visibility is just a function of frequency. So that's how you do. You use the convolution function. Uh, as I said, only average quantities are available in the image domain. So you need to project out the effects of A before you do the average. And that's what a projection does. So the way it does is it, it uses the, this estimate, a model of this, as the grid kernel, and that can that has been shown to take it out. But with this kind of a projection, the effective uh, frequency dependence of the sky that say multi-term MFS sees is this, which is then a time time varying effect according to this equation and according to the images that I showed you in the previous slides. Dynamations I showed you in the previous slide. So you have a time varying variability of the PB, which also needs to be projected out. Now, slide two, two slide, we two run. Why we think uh, projection algorithms is the way to go for, for doing it? So very roughly speaking, the imaging, uh, what we do in integrative imaging has two major steps. In the radio astronomy jargon, it's called major cycle, minor cycle, but in signal processing, terms that could be called computing the update direction and computing the updating the model. And the imaging in this kind of description that we do is the algorithm that we use, minimization algorithm we use, the simplest kind of algorithm, steepest algorithm is what we use in all, all kinds of imaging. 
there you need to, <coughs> in terms of uh, minimum degrees of freedom required to represent, uh, represent any, any effect that you're doing, you need to model those effects in the what we call the natural domain. And I said the natural domain for instrument effect is the data domain, right? Image domain is actually the image domain, a parameterization for natural domain for image domain parameterization. And here is the example using a cartoon that if you have a image, let's say two points of the scaling if you in the sky. Uh, and on the sky, this is an instrumental effect find V. Now how do you model it? How do you argue that the way to model that is in the image domain and not the visibility domain? Is that a very simple function in the image domain looks fairly complicated, so you require more degrees of freedom. Similar arguments apply here that while that is the instrumental effect that is most intuitively understood on the sky, it is a much simpler function on, in the data domain. So it's a much more compressed uh, expression of the same effect. And therefore, this is the domain, visibility domain, is a domain for instrumental effect that is for the sky domain. The other reason is that instrumental effect, which are fundamentally for us, Antenna based remain antenna based in the data, data in the in the data domain. In the image domain, they are not. They are averaged in all kinds of ways. So any variability from antenna to antenna or time and frequency is just kind of handle it. So we need to have a wide band projection <coughs> algorithm. And therefore, the question is that instead of using the kernel that we use in projection, is there a kernel we can come up which then compensates for the frequency dependence of the transfer? And assuming uh, this linear, linear scaling with the frequency, you can come out with a, a kernel which, which is just the A, a kernel. The computer has a frequency which we call conjugate frequency, which is that. Which means that if you are imaging at a reference frequency, continue imaging at a reference frequency. And if you're gridding a frequency there, pick up the conjugate frequency on the other side and just do your imaging. Use that operator for imaging and the normal projection operator for uh, prediction. That is what happens if you use the white binary projection operator. Then this operator, which is the kind of looking as a function of frequency, without which keep scaling with the frequency, if you apply that and ask the question, how does that total product behave as a function of frequency, it's like it doesn't vary with the with the frequency. It has some rambling in the side look at that at a very small level. So that's what the green curve is what the white binary projection operator does. And in slices it's shown here, the derivative of the function of frequency with the projection is here, with W D A projection it is there. So you stabilize in frequency quite a lot. When you apply it to the kind of simulation that I showed you, this is the simulation that you could do best. It is this when you apply a wide line projection, it largely takes takes out this error out. So I think this uh, may be the right combination that will take out all the errors that we need to account for. And this is where we are. I think there are numerical errors still left here. In the, in the dynamic range here is getting you know, a few times like over six or maybe close to like over five. There are numerical errors which we don't understand why why they're not going down further, which we need to work on. But this is where we are. And I think Urvashi has Urvashi's talk will also give you better analysis of why things work the way they do. So very quick uh, Summary of what we what keeps us busy and keeps us employed. Uh, we're worrying about the imaging issues that <laughs> NIO telescopes have in EVLA and ALMA. And remember, between EVLA and ALMA, now we sort of cover from 70 megahertz to a terahertz kind of regime. So the kind of these telescopes put together, they expose an incredible amount of uh, issues in the parameter space of you know imaging and calibration issues. And we need to have a software which, uh, first of all, addresses all those issues. And the flexibility in the software has to be such that we don't need all of them everywhere. For example, if you're working in ARMA, you don't need, you don't need the W term, but you need the A term. If you're working in high frequencies in EVLA, you need the A term and uh, very wide band imaging term, but not other terms. If you're working at very low frequencies, you may need also the W term. If you are doing a spec line imaging, there are some terms you need, some other terms you don't need. Similarly, in the image domain algorithms, you can. So you, depending upon what you're doing, you might need to make a mix and match of the algorithms with the image domain and the data domain. And that flexibility needs to be there in the software that we do. That flexibility is also very useful for us to do the R&D in this area. So what we are currently also going through is 
a lot of code refactoring which allows this kind of flexibility, some of which is in place, which basically consolidates the top level user interface, which is important for some of the users. I don't really care very much for that level. But more flexible interface at the tool interface level, which is mostly used for R&D. And this is a very quick block diagram of what the imaging module does. It has three basic modules. One is for sky modeling. One is for doing the iterative data domain, image domain kind of situations. And then that is the transform machines, which takes you back and forth between data and image domain. What has been inserted here is what is called the data iterators. And the idea there is to apply some on the fly things like calibration and other modification that you might do, you might want to do to your data before they are created on. That module has also been refactored into convolution functions separately, data separately, and the safety machine separately. That flexibility is has been put to use in various things and probably will be put to use in other things. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Have a chance to try this with, with real data yet? The white band. Uh, no, 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 not yet. But, but that's the, really the next step. Right. That's why I said that we didn't get to let the hard data, but we have the data for that. Because the reason I ask is that I, I also expect in the case of the VLA that there should be a sort of periodic modulation uh, of the kind that we saw earlier this week from Cat Seven, but it's there in Westerbork, it's there in Compactor A. The standing waves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and I just wonder when that might also need to be incorporated into the, the frequency dependent uh, B model. B model. I just wondered if you were already bumping up against that. Or I, I think we will bump against that. Yeah. But my take is that the, just the frequency scaling of the primary beam is the highest order effect. Once we take that out, I think we'll expose that yep. and we'll go from there. Thank you.